Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, since 5 p.m., the board has been in uh, closed session to consider the following. Discussion of meetings of minutes, of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act for purposes of approval by the body of the minutes. The appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district or legal counsel for the district. Litigation when an action against, affecting, or on behalf of, a, of the particular district has been filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal. And the sale or purchase of securities, investments, or investment contracts. I will entertain a motion to come out of closed session. So moved. A motion and a second are heard. All those in favor? All right, we are in open session. Welcome to the November 20th board meeting. Um, our mission is to educate students to be self-directed learners, collaborative workers, complex thinkers, quality producers, and community contributors. A roll call, Ms. Bell. Okay, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. We're going to invite our students from Meadow Glen. This evening I've brought four of our fifth grade students from Meadow Glens to help lead in the pledge. They are... Rohan, I'm a fifth grader in Miss Khan's class, Meadow Glens. Luke Liddig in a fifth grade class in Meadow Glens. Kara Payton in Miss Marshall's fifth grade class at Meadow Glens. Cheryl Chang in fifth grade Miss Mason's class at Meadow Glens. you guys to stay right there. Mrs. Fragosa is going to take a picture of this group and then if there are parents or friends of these fine students who would like to take a picture also you're welcome to come up into the center area so that you can get a better picture. So we'll let uh, Mrs. Fragoso take a picture first. <laughs> parents and friends please come forward. Any others? Thank you, Meta Glens. <laughs> this time I'd like to uh, invite the assistant principal from Jefferson Junior High School, Molly Farmer, to come forward, please. Mr. Ross, I might need your help. And then Mr. Freund, maybe you could direct our kids where they go. So every month, uh, the Board of Education recognizes students throughout our school district who exemplify the district's mission statement, any one of the five mission statements. And so this month, we have an opportunity to recognize a group from Jefferson Junior High School. And I'll read their, um, their nomination. Mr. Gonzalez and Mr. Mashman's adapted PE peer buddies are the definition of community contributors and collaborative workers. Each day, these kind, supportive students dedicate their PE period to working with a population of learners who find physical activity and social interactions more difficult. Socially, these teens model positive peer interactions, helping our students build upon their social competencies. Often we observe these same students befriending and showing support for their peer buddies outside of the PE setting too. Academically, they work with Mr. Gonzalez and Mr. Mashman to learn the needs and routines of these students and then correctly demonstrate skills to promote safe participation and competition in adapted PE activities. Under the supervision of their teachers, they lead them in stretches and warm-up together. During the core class time, they partner with them to apply skills learned and make observations and suggestions for how they could tweak something to improve. This class is truly built on compassion and partnership, and we are proud of these outstanding patrons, and the Board of Education would like to recognize them for exemplifying the District 203 mission statement. So with that, I'll invite Assistant Principal Farmer to introduce our kids and to introduce our staff as well. 
Thank you. I believe we lost a staff member in the traffic jam known as the hallway. Um, yes, I just want to say that um, on behalf of Principal Patak, who could not be here uh, this evening, that we are extremely proud of our staff who collaborate so well that really models this behavior for our students who really embrace each other within the school. So I have Mr. Mashman, Ms. Brandis, and Mr. Gonzalez up here, and they are actually going to introduce the students who they work with every single day. This is a great group of kids, and I want to make sure they are all recognized individually. So Andrew Baumgart, Vaughn Bialis, Ellie Coderre, Sean Denker, Rhea Doshi, Abby Grace, Cassidy Grove, Julian here, Claire Jansen, Nathan Calstrand, Maddie Conrad, Katie Crystal, Ashley Kushner, Emily Mittenthal. Ariana Sitzman, Cassidy Smith, Cambria Swanson, and Alexis Wright. There's a great group of kids that work with us every day and are a great role model for their peers. And uh, really, we couldn't do it without them. So let's hear it for them again. I invite you guys to go up there. And once again, we're going to ask uh, Mrs. Fragosa to take her picture, and then uh, bigger group than last time. But of course, parents and friends, if you'd like to come up forward here after Mrs. Fragosa is finished and take your picture, you're more than welcome to. Please. Anyone else? Well, great. Thank you, Jefferson students. We'll let you go about your studies this evening. Thank you to the families who came with you. And as this group works its way out, I'd like to begin by inviting Principal Posey and Coach Iverson to come forward. <laughs> so Mrs. Posey said to me on the soccer field after the awarding of the medals on sat last Saturday night, or two Saturdays ago, that the first Saturday in November is quickly becoming her favorite day of the year. <laughs> no reason to doubt. We have, This evening, the Board of Education is going to recognize two teams for back-to-back -back state championships. Phenomenal accomplishment just one year. Uh, but uh, tremendous honor uh, and credit to the hard work that these student athletes have put forward uh, under the leadership of their coaching staffs. And we're going to begin with the Illinois High School Association state champion girls cross country team and invite 
Coach Iverson to make a couple comments and to invite. Are you gonna? Okay. okay. I'm just gonna shake hands. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, and so, yeah, no, this has been a fantastic year, obviously. We, um, as we stand right now, we're undefeated. Um, I'm joined up here by coaches Jen Wiegand and Anna Craftson. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's been really something else. I mean, uh, a week from Saturday, um, we'll be in action again in Portland, Oregon um, for the national championships. Um, so we won the, regional, uh, the Midwest Regional Championship a week ago. So, um, so yeah, we're kind of proud of that and very excited about that. Um, Additionally, the, 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 the young women you're about to meet, um, we're joined by about 65 or 70 others who um, worked really hard to make this possible. And so you're going to meet the captains of the team and you're going to meet the state team that got a chance to travel to the state meet. Uh, but please know that this is a product of a, a really large group of people who were pretty dedicated all year long. So um, that being said, I'll introduce. Um, okay, uh, Sophia Conforo. Clara Bruce, Sophie Bruce, Madeline Cody, Kate Donaldson, Megan Driscoll, Jill Fitz, Maggie Gamboa, Claire Hill, Karen Hunter, Shannon Jennings, Audrey Mendris, Alex Morris, Molly Morton, Wagner Osborne, Sam Prasma, Hannah Ritchie, and Sarah Schmidt. I think we know our routine by now. We'll let Mrs. Fergoso get a picture and then we'll invite our parents and friends to come forward. Our parents and friends. Congratulations. Good luck next week. And then at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Coach Conrad to join Principal Posey and I. Uh, congratulations, Coach, and your staff. So it may be old news to others, but it was news to me. Coach Iverson talked about uh, the national competition next weekend. I found out today, but again, it may be old news. Naperville North not only is a state champions, but they are ranked number one nationally by Max Preps. So congratulations. I'd like to uh, invite Coach Conrad to make a few comments and then to introduce your team. Great. Thank you. I'd like to start by saying thanks to everyone for being here. Thanks to our district office and, and Ms. Posey and our athletic director, Mr. Quinn, for all their support. Uh, you can really feel it when you're at our games, uh, how much the community is behind us. Um, to talk about the boys a little bit, as Mr. Bridges mentioned, we are currently ranked number one in max preps, which we're thrilled about. Um, it's an amazing thing to win a state championship, but for the boys to go back to back is all the more impressive. You may have heard that they did not give up a single goal in the state tournament, seven games of shutouts uh, in a row. It's a truly impressive thing. Um, and for the boys to handle the pressure of having won a last year and come back and win it this year is um, really an outstanding accomplishment. Uh, I couldn't be happier for them. 
The neat thing is that these boys grew up in the same neighborhoods, playing against us since they were six years old, truly a Naperville success story. So um, I couldn't be happier or prouder for them. All right, so I'd like to start by introducing my assistant coaches, uh, Steve Golitz on my left and Nick Maxa on the end. All right, the, the, the first player is Hashim Atasi. Next, we have Jason Barba. Next, we have Marcel Francis. Kyle Jurup. I'm sorry, <laughs> Kyle Giron. Next, we have Ian Guppy. Captain Ethan Harvey. <laughs> Captain Colin Iverson. <laughs> Colin scored the game winner for us in the finals. Mitch Conrad. <laughs> Ty Conrad. Captain Will Ritzman. Take your Nata Rojas. Christian Romano. Jacob Franken. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Congratulations. Okay, Mrs. Fergoso will take hers, and then parents and friends, you're welcome to come up forward. Okay, so is this on? Yeah. Okay, so at this point in the agenda, we are going to call to order the public hearing regarding the Naperville Community Unit School District 203 application for a waiver on driver's ed simulators. Um, Illinois statute requires that when a school district seeks a waiver from the school code, a public hearing must be held. District 203 is seeking a waiver from the Illinois General Assembly in regard to having the flexibility to offer simulators with driver's education. Okay, so the, the 
Uh, hearing will begin with comments by the administration. The administration's comments will be followed by public comment. If you would like to comment as a part of the public hearing, we have sign-up forms available outside. Um, public comment will be made in, order that the, in the order that the requests to speak are received. Individuals be li will be limited to three minutes. After the public comment, the Board of Education will be invited to provide comment, and then we will close the hearing. So at this point, I'm going to invite the superintendent and your staff to make comments. Assistant Superintendent for Secondary Education, Nancy Voice, will make comments on behalf of the administration for District 203. Good evening. Tonight, I'm pleased to be joined by John Fiore and Neil Duncan, the instructional coordinators at Naperville North High School and Naperville Central High School. The topic of this hearing is the administration asking approval from you, the Board of Ed, to seek a waiver for the part of the law that governs driver's education. In your packets, you will see a memo dated October 31st of 2017 from myself to Superintendent Bridges outlining the details of our driver's ed program, the law, including the most recent Senate Bill 1947, which actually has no impact on this action, and the history of our waiver requests. For the last 10 plus years, we've been operating under this waiver and we're asking you to extend that waiver, which would authorize us to use computer simulators to fulfill three of the six hours of on the street requirement. Computer simulation gives our students experiences such as collision avoidance that cannot be replicated on the street. It allows our students to practice driving techniques such as identifying and predicting potential problems they might encounter on the road. Simulation is often used to train people in the transportation industry including pilots, truck drivers, train engineers, astronauts, and bus drivers. This validates <laughs> the use of simulators as a valuable and viable learning tool for those responsible for handing mo handling modes of travel even at the most sophisticated level. We're happy to hear the public's input on this matter and answer any questions. Okay. At this point, we will have public comments regarding the driver's education simulators, our waiver for that. Do we have any, I don't have any slips, but do we have anyone who would like to address the board regarding the driver's education simulators? Okay. Um, we'll go on to item 4.04, .04, Board of Education comments. Would anybody like to comment from the Board of Ed? Are students allowed to get more than the minimum hours on the simulators? Yes. Additional, Christine. As best as you can tell, do, do the kids feel like they're getting a good experience from the simulators? I mean, I, I'm sure that's a subjective answer, but do they feel appreciative of them? Do they feel like it's working? When they do go out yeah. on the road? John and Neil could speak more. I was in the classroom and talked to some of the kids myself recently, and they definitely um, felt that it was worth their time. They appreciated There's a number of different modules, so they have the opportunity, depending on where their background is and where they started. So the kids that don't have as much background knowledge on it can take modules to catch them up to speed, um, and they can work at their own pace. And uh, it's been very valuable to do some kind of prediction, things that they may not get an opportunity to do um, behind the wheel. They do enjoy them. They're very real. <laughs> Is there anything you guys want to add? Okay. Any additional comments from the board? Charles? <laughs> So um, is the program here on the simulators updated from time to time, or is it pretty consistent? Is there, are there like software upgrades to make the situations more and more real as they go forward? Yeah. John and Neil, yeah. please yeah, come forward. And, um, yep. We actually got new simulators, uh, our second year for new simulators. Yeah. Uh, we... My name is John Fiore. I'm the Structural Coordinator for the Wellness Department in April North. Uh, we actually ob obtained new simulators two years ago, and we've been this is our second school year utilizing them. And it's an updated where it's an individualized. Uh, many of you probably know simulation from the old traditional where you have 12 or 15 just looking at the same screen. This is actually interactive with the individual students' uh, skill level as well as the uh, individualized lessons. Uh, the software ca can be and is updated. That's what was kind of inviting to going to this system because right now the system is uh, obviously can be updated um, um, from year to year and whatever they come out with the latest and greatest. I have a quick question. Um, so do you feel like we're meeting our objectives of providing a safe and varied experience for our students in doing the simulators and doing that instead of the driving? Uh, 
Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I started out in driver education at April North and seeing what our, the transformation our program has gone through, not just in simulation, but also in the classroom and the behind the wheel phase. They really complement each other and make it a cohesive and also a, a cooperative experience between the teacher, the student, and the parent. Great. Okay. Any other Board of Education comments? Okay. Donna? So I don't have a question, just a comment so that I, I think the public is aware of those who have teenagers of this age, but those who have younger ones, the, the students are also required to have 50 hours that they clock of, of time behind the wheel that they will do with a parent or an adult who has a, uh, a driver's license. So I love the varied experience that they get because they get two, two different opportunities with the simulator and behind the wheel with the instructor. But then the majority of those hours are done with another um, adult. So I, I don't think that they're losing anything. Or I think it's they're gaining a second experience. So thank you for, for that. Any other comments? Okay. I would ask for a motion to adjourn the public hearing. And remember, our vote on this will come later in our agenda. Okay. Motion to adjourn the public hearing. Second. Motion and a second are heard. Please call the roll, Ms. Bell. Aye. Bush. Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. Turkey. Yes. Okay. The motion passes. We have adjourned the public hearing. Moving on to our agenda, our next agenda item, we have already passed good news. We had a lot of good news to report um, and our mission maker. Um, it's now the point on the agenda. Hmm, I'm, no, but we, yes, okay, public comment. Um, so we've come to this point. Um, we welcome comments from the public at all of our meetings. Citizens who wish to address the Board of Education should identify yourself by your name and home address. Comments by individuals shall be limited to three minutes. If the person is representing multiple individuals or a group, such person may be allowed to speak for five minutes. <laughs> Issues raised during public comment will be taken under advisement by the Board of Education, but will not be discussed this evening. Issues raised during public participation may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff. I do have one uh, public comment form from the Center for Student Safety, Peter Labor. Okay. I'm just going to speak into this if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. My name is Peter Labor. I live at uh, 957 Collingwood Drive. Naperville, Illinois. Mr. Labor, yes, if you sir. wouldn't mind either take it off the stand or oh, move sure. closer. Yeah, Thank I'm you. Sorry. Let's let's try it this way. Does this work a little better? Thank you. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, my questions are: um, since 2011, what steps has Naperville District 203 taken to provide accredited certification training for staff and student resource officers? When was the last time the training took place, and when is the next time you plan to have it? Those are the simple questions I asked last week, or last month, I should say, at the meeting. It's been um, 35 days, and still, we've had no answers. The first response to me was to say that my son's case had no relevance because the statute of limitations had run out and the time had passed. Um, I let you know that my son's case has no relevation, or relevance to this situation. It's really about the fact that District 203 has done little since 2011 to provide the proper training. Um, we begged for it back then, and it's coming up on seven years now. Um, they then requested a private meeting with me um, with Superintendent Bridges and Board President Fitzgerald. Uh, I had to just decline because I just found it curious. They, didn't, they chose not to include the other board members. And, and I feel like this should be done openly. District 203 needs to honestly answer these questions publicly for all to hear. Um, it shouldn't be this difficult. Wow. Thank you, NC-17 and Naperville families. We're smashing all records. Our last discussion with District 203 is over 19,000% increase in YouTube views over the previous two-year meeting view average. In one month, the total number is almost half of what some of you got in votes in the last school board election. It seems people are getting quite interested. For any of you that might not have seen it, you can go to centerforstudentsafety.org and click on the Must Watch tab. Since our last meeting, we have brought the Center for Student Safety to life as a fully registered 501c3 limited liability corporation. We've begun the formation of advisory council 
that includes some very established individuals that we will be announcing soon, along with a formal press release. To boil it down, the Center for Student Safety is a multicultural, multifamily-led organization promoting a safe learning environment for all students throughout the world. We have programs and suggestions for students, parents, educators, and lawmakers. Over the next month or so, you will see lots of changes and additions to the Center for Student Safety website. Please visit and provide suggestions. In a broader effort to promote safe learning environments, along with our anti-bullying slash suicide campaign, we have student-led, student outreach, cyber awareness, anti-gang, and anti-opiate programs. We've had great discussions and are forming strong partnerships with experts in each of these areas. But along with them, we welcome everybody's help, especially concerned families. These problems are not exclusive to Naperville, and we do plan to address them from a broader geographic standpoint. However, since we're based here, and what we are told is one of the best school districts in the country, what better place to start? Wouldn't you agree? So along with still wanting answers to our questions from last month, I have one more for you. 18 days from today, December 8th, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., the National Exchange Club is hosting a seven-hour live interactive intensive webinar specifically on cyber training for school administration and law enforcement. There will be many topics covered, but probably most important, school administrators and law enforcement will learn how to properly investigate and process students slash juveniles as it relates to cyber matters. I'll be attending and will personally pay the $100 per attendee fee for each board member, including Superintendent Bridges. I have handouts and information for you and will send each of you a link so that you can register. Just let me, who will be, let me know who will be attending and I'll, arrangement, or I'll make arrangements to pay. You see, it all comes down to the proper staff training we begged for seven years ago. You didn't know what to do then. My contention is you still don't know now. Sadly, it's plain to see. With proper training, what happened with Corey Walgren could have been avoided. First thing, get the parents, the dean, and the student resource officer in the room. Then bring the boy in for questioning when his parents are there. Things would have turned out differently. This didn't have to happen. Please help. Go to Center for Student Safety for more information and messages on Facebook. Once again, I'll leave you with this message from last month. Every day is not a good day, but there's good in every day. God bless you and thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Do we have any other slips for people who would like to address the board? I don't have any additional slips, but is there anyone in the audience who'd like to address the board? Great. Great, thank you. Okay, we will go on in our agenda to the monthly reports. Items 7.01, 02, 03, and 04 are monthly reports. Are there any questions from the Board of Education on any of the monthly reports? Okay. Um, we'll go on next to our action by consent. Um, I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay, so um, this month was my opportunity to review bills and claims. So um, thank you to Marcy and Melanie for walking me through that. They, as usual, did an excellent job. Um, so with that, I would like to make a motion to approve. Uh, I, so I make a, a motion for approval of warrant number 1002181 through warrant number 1003. 079 totaling twenty eight million five hundred and eighty six dollars nine one hundred ninety one dollars and forty two cents for the period of October seventeenth, twenty seventeen through November twentieth, twenty seventeen, and um, items eight point oh two, item eight point oh four, and the meeting minutes from October sixteenth, twenty seventeen. A motion and a second are heard. Please call the roll, Ms. Bell. Aye. Aye. Uh, the, the motion passes. Yes. 
Before we move on to the next item, yes. as a result of the action on the consent agenda, we do have an announcement to share with the community. Uh, it's uh, my honor to introduce to the, the Board of Education and the community the next Executive Director for the Naperville Education Foundation, Wendy Gutsch. Wendy, please stand. So as you know, uh, NEF is a significant partner of District 203, and we have a strong partnership with the foundation, the Board of Trustees representing the, the foundation. There are a number of trustees who are here. Uh, Wendy was a part of a rigorous selection, con uh, rigorous selection process, which resulted in her unanimous approval by the Board of Trustees to serve as their next executive director. And since the position as the executive director has been vacant since March, uh, Wendy has been described as the glue which has held the foundation together, serving as uh, the donor database manager for the past couple of years. Wendy steps right into this role with a good sense of how the foundation has operated and a good sense on where the board of trustees are thinking about in terms of the future of the foundation. Uh, as a parent of District 203 students as well and a resident in District 203, I know she's personally committed to the success not only of District 203 but the foundation and it is an honor to welcome her as its next executive director. So. Welcome. Welcome, Wendy. <laughs> All right, we are on in our next, Wait, oh, right, yet. one more. Okay, so uh, I would also like to um, make a motion to approve the meeting minutes from November 6th, 2017. Second. A motion and a second are heard. Please call the roll, Ms. Bell. Bush? Abstain. Leong? Aye. 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 Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Next, written communications, item 9.01. There are all of our Freedom of Information requests for your review. Next on the agenda, item 9.02, student ambassador reports. Preston. Hello. Um, as you can, as you see tonight, uh, the last month of Naperville North has been quite eventful. Uh, to follow up on the last month, last month's sports update, as you can see, uh, the girls' cross country team placed first in the IHSA state meet, leading with Sarah Schmidt finishing in fourth, and Alex Morris finishing in seventh place overall. Uh, moreover, the boys' soccer team also won state, as you heard, beating Liber Libertyville one zero with Collins Iverson's goal. Uh, this was a two-peat, as you heard, and uh, due to this, we are actually having an assembly tomorrow at the end of the school day to recognize and honor their achievements. Um, in addition, this weekend, the girls' swim team also participated at their state meet with Connie Zhang finishing in eighth place. Um, not only did we have uh, multiple sports updates, we also had uh, Colonel Harvey Barnum, who is a Medal of Honor winner who came to speak with us during Veterans Day to talk about uh, his roles in fighting and uh, to support Veterans Day itself. Um, just a quick fun fact is that uh, one is more likely to be struck by lightning twice uh, before meeting him. So that just shows his prestige and uh, amount of uh, honor that he has coming with him. Uh, so we were very lucky to be able to hear from a, such a monumental person in American history. And uh, we also had Jim Corneliuson, uh, who sang the national anthem, who also who sings for the uh, Blackhawks. And then lastly, we have uh, 47 students who received the national merit who were commended and recognized. And we also uh, recognized unsung heroes who make a difference throughout the school. Uh, we also had the radio play in North Scott Talent, which displayed all different kinds of talents from these students. And finally, uh, National Honor Society nominated their new members, and Spanish National Honor Society started selling hand-woven wo hand wo uh, bracelets and purses called pulseras uh, to help people in Central America and employ artists, which receive 100% of the profit. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that excellent report, Preston. Okay, we are on item 9.03, Superintendent Staff School Report. Later this evening, the Board of Education will be asked to consider the 2017 tax levy determination uh, throughout uh, the course of the year on, on more than one occasion in order to assist the Board of Education with its discussion uh, in decision-making regarding the, the financial state of District 203. 
uh, administration presents to the Board of Education a five-year financial forecast. That's our purpose this evening, is to update the five-year financial forecast and share with you feedback from our Citizens Finance Advisory Committee, which is made up of residents in our community who are in various fields, which we believe their expertise and background can provide additional information into our assumptions in which we build our model for a five-year financial forecast. So this evening, I'm going to invite our Chief Financial Officer, Chief School Business <laughs> Official, Marcy Boyan, to come to the presentation table and to share with the Board of Education its five-year financial forecast. Forecast. So, Marcy. Thank you, Super Superintendent Bridges. This is our preliminary look at projections to begin the budgeting process for fiscal year 2018-19 and moving forward. Uh, this early in the process, we focus on revenue plans and known expenses. On November 14th, the Citizens Finance Advisory Committee met to discuss current economic conditions and planning recommendations, reviewed the district's finance, finances and administration's accountability for revenue and expenditures and plans moving forward. We also discussed state funding, the tentative recommendation to abate the future debt service levy, and conferred about the 2008 bonds and the possible permanent abatement of said bonds, which will save taxpayers $3.2 million in interest expense and provide a permanent tax abatement. We plan a five-year financial forecast that is comprehensive, interactive planning, and the district uses it for budget development processes, tax levy determination, and general future planning. The district contracts with PMA Financial of Naperville, which provides the forecasting software and a consultant to assist the district with this planning tool. The five-year projections are developed based upon considerable historical data, <coughs> as you see listed on the screen. We learn from the past and build assumptions based upon past practice and known future changes. Our goal is always to see how decisions we make today affect the district and the community long term. The program uses calculators, reviewing historical data and data assumptions for future known changes to calculate most local and state revenue and a majority of our expenses. The district levies two types of taxes, operating levy, which is tax capped, and debt service, which is not tax capped. Property Tax Extension Limit Law, or PTEL, limits the increase in our operating tax levy to the lesser of 5% or the Consumer Price Index, which is currently 2.1%. Additionally, tax on new property or new growth. Debt service is set as a part of the bond referendum and is automatically levied unless abated by the Board of Education by March of each year. New growth plays a large part in future planning for the district and the community. With the many uncertainties we are facing with the federal government leadership, we do not want to be too aggressive in future year prosperity and growth estimates. This is an area in which input from our Finance Advisory Committee was very helpful. We have created several financial scenarios focusing on revenue assumptions. For the purposes of this presentation, we have focused on a scenario that includes consumer price index for 2017 and a possible tax freeze for years 2018 and 19. With what's going on in the state's General Assembly, there's a very strong belief that a two-year tax freeze is on the horizon. It has passed the House of Representatives and will be presented to the Senate in late January. It is important that we plan for this potential outcome. We are in a property value upturn, but wish to be moderately conservative, conservative on speculating future years with the uncertainty in our government decisions and actions. With state funding, though we know there is intent to make payments in full, with the financial condition of the state, the question was posed to the committee, do we want to assume full payment? 90% has been a recent budget assumption, and we maintained consistency on this. The state was behind by $3 million for last fiscal year 16-17. They have started to make up those payments in the month of October, but well after the fiscal year ended. 17% of dollars committed was late. In our projections, we are very critical of assumptions made for the upcoming year in particular. And the future years beyond that are speculative at this point. It is critical that we understand long-term impact of the decisions we make in the near term, and this is why we look five years ahead when planning. This is a brief update on state funding. It is determined first by the availability of local funding in comparison to the expenses associated with evidence-based best practices that meet the needs of the students in a community. School funding is tied to evidence-based best practices 
The research shows enhanced student achievement, achievement in the classroom defined by 27 essential elements. Though the funding is still being evaluated and finalized, this year's determination is an additional $30,000 to our state funding. Of the new state funding, Tier 1 school districts receive 50% of new funding dollars. Tier 2 districts receive 49% of new funding dollars. Tier 3 districts receive 9 tenths of 1% of new dollars. And Tier 4 districts receive 1 tenth of 1% of new dollars. Uh, district 203 is a Tier 4 district. Sensitivity analysis is important because it helps us understand how an individual assumption will impact the five-year projections. The largest three levers are listed on the screen. As you can see from this, the consumer price index is the most important revenue assumption there is. I'll go into more detail about the CPI during the tax levy presentation. The impact of state funding or evidence-based funding model probation is also listed on the screen. This is a visual of the revenue by source the district is very dependent on local property taxes. Salaries and benefits are designed with meeting our commitments with the current collective bargaining agreements. In addition, we estimated future agreements that will, agreements that will soon be negotiating. We are also analyzing benefit claims, trends for health and dental, and are planning a 5% increase annually moving forward. This projection is assuming current programs are maintained, too. The information we're sharing this evening focuses on the revenue, and our goal is to have good consensus on revenue before we dig into any changes in our programs or expenditures. Last year, our district removed the pension cost shift scenario from the projections, and the current projections are sticking with that plan. Again, sensitivity analysis helps us understand an individual assumption on the, on the projections, and the largest indicators for expenses are salaries and benefits. And this is a visual of the expenses by object. The current scenario assumes a recommendation to abate debt service levy as well. If all our assumptions were to hold true and we maintain current educational programs without additions, this is a look at the financial state of the district. All the assumptions are accumulated into fund financial statements, which are then aggregated into a final projection summary. Please note, with this scenario, we're also projecting the district will call the, two, the 2008 bonds $9.5 million in outstanding bonds in February of this year. Key information to view on this sheet, if you can read it, is midway down the surplus and deficit. That'll tell you how we're planning or projecting to end any given year. And the last line is fund balance as a number of months of expenses. That means how many months we could operate on the existing funds with no new revenue. This chart shows past, present, and future data regarding actual and planned revenue and expenditures. You'll notice that this current fiscal year, we have planned a deficit spending budget. This is due to the recommendation to redeem the 2008 bonds in fiscal year 18. Our goal is always to curb or prevent that if possible, so we're diligently monitoring our expenses. This chart is a five-year outlook of our fiscal year end balances, and the bar charts indicate the same by fund. For the purpose of comparison, this is a chart for a three-year tax freeze scenario. It shows past, present, and future data regarding actual and planned revenue and expenditures. And you do see the bars cross at this point. This chart shows past, present, and future data uh, if there was no tax freeze estimated. <clears throat> Last year, the district abated the 2016 debt service levy. The principal and interest were paid with education fund reserves. Abating the 2017 debt service levy, um, if all factors were to hold true with CPI, EAV, Equalized Assessed Value of Homes, and New Construction, uh, an average homeowner value of about $400,000 could save roughly $88 in their taxes. The district currently has $9.5 million of 2008 bonds 
that were issued to finance capital projects. The bonds mature from 2025 through 2028 and have interest rates ranging from 3.88% to 4%. The district repurchased and canceled $500,000 worth of these bonds back in 2014. The original amount was $10 million at that time. The 2008 bonds are subject to optional redemption with a call date of February 1st of this fiscal year. The district has set aside $9.5 million of our long-term investment reserves to prepare for a redemption and to cancel the 2008 bonds should the board advise us to. This redemption would eliminate more than $3.2 million in interest owned, owed on the bonds after the call date. Something we do need to consider, though, is that we are losing investment earnings on the $9.5 million, which could affect revenue moving forward. However, the advantages to our community cost savings far outweigh any investment earning opportunities on, the, on these dollars. The debt service levy tax rate will reduce in future years by eight-tenths of a cent per $100 of equalized assessed value of property in levy years 2017 through 2022, and about five cents per $100 EAV for levy years 2023 through 2026. <laughs> Factors bearing on the district. Last year, we abated the debt service levy and made payments with fund balance reserves and we're tentatively recommending the same for this year. Financial impact of the 2008 bond repurchase is considered, and it's a great savings and a message to our community. The two-year property tax freeze appears to be gaining traction. Sorry, this is going forward on me. There we go. Our fund balance to expense reserves is about eight and a half months, meaning we could operate that long without funding before reserves run out. Our reserves are healthy, but not objectionable or extravagant. Despite the positive aspects of the new evidence-based funding model to all schools, there is no guarantee, as much as we hate to think about it, that the state will meet the minimum funding level of $350 million each year to fund the basic elements. In addition to that, we need to consider the negotiating of two collective bargaining agreements this year, the initiatives to increase summer school programs, and that we will be bidding uh, transportation contracted services in a very challenging employment uh, environment. <clears throat> Feedback we have received from the Citizens Finance Advisory Committee include the support of a full levy request, particularly crucial if a two-year tax freeze is on the horizon. We can always choose not to take the full extension if necessary. Our community experts provided guidance on assumptions incorporated in our financial projections. Warren Dixon, Naperville Township Assessor, advised us to lower our community new growth assumptions for years 2019 through 2022 to 37 million. Previous estimate was cons consistent with the current growth of 45 million. Kathy Soto, Benefits Consultant, advised us to adjust our future benefit cost estimates to match the district's past performance of beating the trend. She said recommended to maintain a 5% annual increase in lieu of an initial projection of 5% and then 6% 6 increments thereafter. The committee supports the abatement of the 2017 debt service levy with fund balance. They also support the repurchase of the 2008 bonds with fund reserves totaling $9.5 million. In conclusion, there are so many variables that create different scenarios, new growth, the debt service levy abatement, property tax freeze, bond repurchase, the economy and yield on investments, and negotiations. The good news is we're looking at all situations and are quickly able to update known changes and see how they affect the district long term. This allows us to make wise decisions and to prevent concerns and issues from affecting us down the road without our knowledge. And I welcome dialogue from the group. A couple quick additional uh, comments before. Uh board conversation. I just I would note that uh, the Board of Education is represented by two board members on the Citizens Finance Advisors Committee. Janet Yang Rohr and Terry Fielden were both present uh, at, at our last meeting. And I'll note that the next meeting is scheduled for January 23rd, 2018, which time we can update any assumptions based on uh, known circumstances at that time and Board of Education input. I'd also like to add, I know some board members may report out um, some of the professional learning they had uh, over the past few days at the joint annual conference. Um, I will share that I know others attended a different session of it, but I did attend a legislative session um, that uh, included uh, two uh, representatives uh, and one member of the state senate. 
as well as uh, Mike Jacoby, the uh, Executive Director of the Illinois Association of School Business Officials, uh, and Illinois State Superintendent Tony Smith. Uh, there has some, been some discussion about whether or not a property tax freeze would actually uh, be approved. Uh, you know, we've heard that, uh, we heard from legislators, one of the state reps talked about the fact that it's, it's been called 18 times and it hasn't been passed. But all of the members of the panel uh, did indicate that this, uh, this is in a different circumstance now than it has been in the past, and that uh, they advised that this is something that would be considered again in the spring. Second thing I would share that uh, the conversation had seemed to quiet down a little bit. Uh, Marcy mentioned it, that uh, be, uh, past um, uh, feedback from the Citizens Advisors has been not to include a uh, pension cost shift in our projections. Uh, the idea of some form of pension reform or cost shift was discussed again by all of the legislators and members of the panel that I sat through. So I do think we need to be alert to what occurs in the spring session uh, and what our legislators are discussing. So with that, uh, unless Marcy has any additional comments, we'll uh, turn over to the board for questions or comments. Maybe I'll um, just give a little bit of color to, to what I saw attending the meeting. Um, so, so first of all, you know, every... The, 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 the advisory committee ultimately accepted um, what District 203 and what Marcy presented, and but it was definitely with um, kind of going through the details and, and, and really looking at all the assumptions. So it wasn't, um, so, so, so there was there was a lot of examination, I think, of, of the numbers. Um, so uh, for, for example, um, you know, kind of given all the, the various like state legislative actions and um, kind of just, just all those other uncertainties um, that, that Dan mentioned, um, I, I think the, the the group was very supportive of taking like a more conservative view, um, understanding that we could also we could always dial it back later. So I, I think that was that was a good move. And then um, you know I just wanted to uh, I think Marcy kind of hinted at this already, but um, the group had you know I, I was impressed by kind of the wide variety of expertise that that was represented there. You had um, you know the the kind of the financial expertise, the legislative, the property, the um, health and welfare, right? Health and welfare benefits. And, and so that, I think, made for some, some really good conversation and, and let us like really d dig deep into a, a lot of the, um, the considerations. So, so I want to thank them, obviously, for, for uh, helping there. Thank you, Janet, for that review and for your participation representing the Board of Ed on that committee. Um, questions from the Board of Education with regard to the presentation? We just again say we can't come back to some of what's within this when we get to the item regarding the levy as well too if it makes sense so you know. would the board prefer to hold the discussion with the five-year financial to the levy discussion or do we have specific questions based on the the five-year forecast and the assumptions within you have questions with regard to the levy I have one with regard to an assumption. Can you talk a little bit more about the healthcare assumption and specifically looking at our past couple of years of what we've projected and what has actually occurred for us? Okay. We've actually had some very good years in terms of our health and benefits claims. Um, from uh, We've had a couple years where we've had freezes and we've had a 5% increase one year. I think that was 15 to 16. And the next year, we actually had a reduction in our, in our premiums. And that had to do with the fact that uh, the, the district introduced, the insurance committee introduced new design plans that had higher deductibles um, and different programs, which actually re reduced the, the, uh, the premium costs. And then we have had um, from, 16, um, from 17 to 18, we've had a 0% change in our premiums as well. Um, the district has focused on a wellness initiative, uh, and the big promotion is to um, know your benefits, know your numbers, and improve your numbers. So we've really been encouraging people to take a more proactive approach to their health, and um, it's been wonderful so far. So the only concern I would have about that is simply it's a testimony to the great work of that committee that we have had zero and a, and a decrease. Mm -hmm. um, the more that we project 5% and have a zero, that's when we come up with our audit, which we'll see later, variance, and looking yes. yeah, with the variance. So the Board of Education just needs to be aware of that. That's a conservative a assumption, but one that has led us in the past to end up with, you know, our projections not quite meeting our expenditures. 
Yeah, I would just say that, um, and, and Janet mentioned this, you know, Kathy did provide her feedback on it as well, Kathy Soto and Citizens Finance Advisors Committee. And we had initially projected, I think, 6% in years out, and she thought that was a little bit too conservative based on our track record, and that's why we backed it down to five, in which we really did def defer to her expertise and felt that that was a safe, although conservative, estimate. And that may be something we wish to consider moving forward. We can revisit that in January as well, but um, that's part of this discussion in terms of direction from the board that we would share with Kathy and, and, and move from there. And she shared with us the trends overall outside of our school district, and um, and that's what we were tracking with. And she says, y go with your track record because mm -hmm. you've been doing better than the right. trends. Right. And we have done significantly better. Thanks to the work of that committee, I see yes. Mark Bailey in the back, and I'm pointing at him as I'm talking because I know that that's a partnership committee that, that has really endeavored to try to continue to prevent those big increases, and it has worked. So, you know, that is successful. I think that would be my continued question in looking at trying to accurately project um, is, you know, our track record has been significantly better than 5%. Definitely it's not 6, but it's, it hasn't been 5 either. And so to the extent that we go conservatively, we might even want to consider going down even a percent because looking at your slide, I see the $294,000 per percent. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, when you multiply it times five, it's over a million dollars that would end up being a variance for us. I would never suggest that we would go with zero because that would be probably a little bit too worrisome. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I guess that would be my question going back to the committee. Based on our own experience, we are significantly better than 5%. So to continue to build in that 5%, I hope we don't have that, and I hope it's my hope that that committee is able to continue to see the kinds of successful initiatives that they've put forward that help to mitigate those increases. And it, it seems like the wellness is one that we haven't even yet really seen the great impact of. So I would be hopeful that that would really continue to help us in that regard. Any additional thoughts about the assumptions behind the five-year forecast? Charles. Thank you. I do have one question. So the the 90% assumption around kind of the conservative, if we only get 90% of the state allocated funding, um, given some of the uncertainty, what, were the, what was some of the discussion around the 90% that got us there? I know that we've looked at that and it's consistent with what we did last year, but um, any thoughts around whether or not that the 90% reflects a um, conservative enough estimate given some of the difficulties? Um, it was mo more about maintaining consistency with how it's been budgeted in the past. Um, they were behind by 17% this past year. However, you have to factor in um, we received late payments from the previous year that uh, went into the last fiscal year. So I that helped absorb some of it, too, or, 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 or limited that gap. So a, a constant lateness. Right. Is, is making us closer to between 90 and 95 percent. Got it. Okay. That was going to be my, That's yeah, no, that, that, that was going to be my follow-up question. And if you didn't have it, this, how much of it has tended to bridge over it, um, it fiscal is, years for it us? It's so. varied every year. Okay. It's very, okay. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. And if we have any additional questions that we think of, we can bring them up as a part of the levy discussion as well. Okay. Thank you so much for that great presentation, Marcy. Okay, moving on to the FY 2017 audit, item 9.05. Okay, this evening is the presentation for the boards uh, to receive uh, the financial audit uh, from the past year annually. We, can, uh, we engage an independent accounting firm to conduct an audit. We are scheduled for discussion on the findings and what's in there on December 18th. Um, so, Marcy, any additional comments to make right now? Regarding the fiscal year 17 annual audit, overall the district ended the year with an all funds positive net change of 4% in fund balance. This equates to $11.1 .1 million overall. The district continues to be fiscally responsible and underspent overall expenditure budget by a little less than 1%, which equates to $2.3 million, primarily in benefits. The financial auditors did not identify any deficiencies in internal control over financial reporting that would be considered a material weakness. They did not disclose any instance of noncompliance or other matters that required reporting. They did make a few recommendations for improvement that are listed in your letter, and I've also included actions that the business office is planning in consideration of those recommendations. Again, we'll have the opportunity for a more in-depth conversation regarding the audit um, once you've had an opportunity to review the document. 
Okay. So, and that will be in December. December 18th, correct. Okay. Great. Moving on to item 9.06, President's Report. Um, I would love to report to my colleagues that um, as your delegate to the uh, IASB Delegate Assembly at the Illinois Association of School Boards meeting over the weekend, um, our resolution, which had um, proposed a change to the um, Illinois Association of School Boards position statements with regard to um, under-levying, um, under-levying the PTEL limit, um, we did have that resolution pass. It passed as a part of the consent agenda, and so there was an overall vote and um, no real questions or no real concerns. Everyone was very supportive of that tool, which I think will really give guidance to our, our legislators. Now they're going to have to act and provide legislation to give us the, these tools, but I think every overall all the school boards were very supportive of the idea that um, it will help us to have the tools to be able to um, – Levy the exact right amount if we can, sometimes under levying our PTEL limits um, if we have the financial wherewithal to do so, um, but then sort of have that protection for our students that if the state would then act with, say, a property tax freeze, um, we would be able to come back and adjust that um, based on the change that we had not been able to foresee. Um, so all of the school districts are very um, supportive of that. Um, and in addition, all of the other resolutions passed as well, including the District 204 resolution on polling um, reimbursement um, and the um, additional, additional ones that had been opposed by the resolutions committee also did not pass, even if they were debated. We debated the 1% mandatory county tax, um, and that failed. So that was not agreed to by the um, majority of the members. Does anybody have any questions about the Delegate Assembly? It was certainly um, a great experience um, to um, listen to the dialogue from the various school districts, and I think um, we're really well served. Um, Terry uh, played a part in that in terms of the resolutions chair, and he was actually the counter of the votes. They had a very key role there in the Delegate Assembly, um, so we were well represented by Terry as well. Okay. Um, moving on to item 9.07, Board of Education reports. And at this time, we wanted to have uh, board members talk a little bit about the continuing education that they were able to um, receive at the ISB convention or, or meeting this, this weekend. Comments from the Board of Ed. Christine. So I, I did attend the conference this past weekend, and it was my first one. So um, although I had been to other conferences, you're still always nervous about, is it going to be the same or is it going to be different? I didn't get lost, so I thought that was a, a benefit, first of all. I did put on um, some steps if I had a working Fitbit. But ultimately, um, it was, uh, you know, again, I'm looking at it from the perspective of a first-year board member. Um, there were too many opportunities, and it was so hard to narrow down what I could do in really only Saturday, because Friday I had other pre-conference workshops that took up my time. And so the biggest problem I had was how can I make the most of my, my time on Saturday? But I did sit in and watch the delegate assembly, and um, I liked watching... The only words I can use to describe it, there's like an organized chaos about the process, so it was fun to see how everybody um, went about approaching these resolutions and, and the different viewpoints. Um, I thankfully went to two on school uh, finance. <laughs> so what I had in class on Saturday has shown up here. So that was, that was a great call on my part. Um, but it was also really good to see um, and to hear uh, other people in other districts. And, and for me to just sit back and listen and and hear the good and the bad and try to figure out where we fall as as a community so um the whole experience for me i don't think i could really put a price tag on it for my first year so i'm i'm grateful that i had the opportunity to attend great thank you janet um i i really uh, also appreciated the opportunity to attend um for me you know it, it's it's just always great to be able to connect with other school districts and, and other people who are doing you know similar things as you um, for, you know, one of the most striking things to me was um, 
kind of the uh, the ability to um, kind of benchmark our processes against other districts and, and what they're doing and, and kind of what the um, the different breakout sessions are, are calling out as best practices and, and what was, you know, really obvious is we're already doing a lot of those best practices and that's, you know, hats off to, to our administration here. Um, at the same time, there are a lot of, uh, I think, new ideas coming from coming from other districts. Um, I'm, I'm going to put out there for Dan, he should start doing a um, weekly video like his, his Huntley colleagues are doing, um, maybe. And... Um, I think, but, but generally, I think we have a great video coming pretty soon, right? <laughs> All right. Um, I, I just really liked um, kind of learning all these new frameworks for for um, for, for running a district, I guess, and it, it was just really interesting to me um, to to be able to participate, and I, I really do appreciate that. Paul. My focus was to uh, learn from panelists as well as other board members and superintendents how best to uh, approach and work uh, the achievement gaps. And the experience was vast. Uh, in addition to having a more severe achievement gaps than us, I talked to people whose, who's, uh, you know, the diversity in their districts was some similar to ours and, and many different than ours. And I learned a lot of different techniques, methods, and I, you know, I gained a lot of ideas and insight into how other people are working these problems. And what I walked away with was, although we have a long way to go and we can try a lot of new things, uh, at present I think we're doing a fairly good job of it. And I hope we continue to do so. Charles? Yeah, this is uh, actually my second one. Um, first time around, like Christine, I was focused on just not getting lost, so, um, and I was successful in not getting lost last time. Um, but uh, this time around was different. I had the opportunity to really kind of dig in and focus on a couple of key topics. Um, one thing that none of us have mentioned yet is the uh, the keynote speakers. I had some pretty good keynote speakers. Um, one who I had heard of um, and had high expectations for, and those were met, um, Ruby Payne, and then the other, a guy named Tim Kite, who I'd never heard of. Um, and so I guess that kind of set the expectation pretty, mm, oh, I don't know who this guy is, but a uh, very, very powerful talk that he gave on Friday. And um, one thing to take away from there was the idea of E and R and O. Um, e is equal to event, so event plus response equals outcome. And his key message was we can drive whatever outcomes we want um, the events are kind of given. Sometimes you just kind of dealt a hand, but your response is something that you have control over. And I thought that was really powerful. Um, and it not just only applies to us as uh, you know leaders within the community, but then also as individuals. And I thought that was pretty powerful. One of the more powerful things that he said was, always keep in mind, especially as we think of applying this to our personal lives and families, that your response is somebody else's event which I thought was, uh, I wrote that down. I was like, oh, that's a good one. Um, so that was uh, very, uh, very powerful. And, and then the conference overall, um, I had a chance to attend a couple of uh, different workshops and things to hear about best practice and what have you. But the overwhelming thing for me was just the opportunity to really spend, you know, a day and a half or two, two, day, two full days, I guess, basically, just focused in thinking. And being able to reflect and you know share side conversations with other people that you're that you don't have the opportunity to interact with all the time to just get some perspective on how their district is handling different things and it's just a great time to to see the range of challenges that folks are grappling with recognizing that there's some commonalities um but at the same time i think as janet pointed out recognizing that there are a lot of things that we as a, a district um, um are leading the way in um, we still have work to do, obviously, um, but uh, there's a lot of areas that we have to be proud of, and that was kind of my net takeaway from the couple of days. So um, having gone to the conference a number of times in the past, it was interesting at this point to pick out um, some of the different panels and, and some of the different um, conference points that, um, as I'm going to echo what my colleague said, is that we are leading the way. And so um, it's interesting, though, because even, even when you go to um, a conference that 
you know that we're already implementing, there's still new and different ideas there. And so what's interesting though, is as the ones that I chose um, are all things that we've discussed in the last year and are, are, and are implementing, but I did you know, get, gain some new insight from those. So I'm just gonna quickly share some of them because I think it's important that the community hears and my colleagues so that we can share, um, but the financial stewardship in Illinois, I mean, we've just had a lot of talks about that, but they were really great about giving us ideas of um, new revenue and ideas of better expenditure control. So that was, um, I learned a lot there. Um, positive behavior interventions and restorative practices, which is something that's coming out of Senate Bill 100, that we um, we do a lot of that already. But then there were some new ideas, I think, or maybe maybe they were new to me. Maybe you guys are doing them already. I just don't know about it, but, uh, which is very likely. College and career readiness is something on our Focus 2020 goals. And um, there was a seminar on that that I thought was really very interesting as well. Um, enhanced instructional skills and PLCs is something that we're implementing to share at the high schools with our late start. And to hear, I, so I wanted to just be more informed of how other schools were using PLCs as well. Um, Standard-based reporting I went to because um, it particularly said K-12, and I know that we're doing that um, K-8 and looking towards um, um, how we can make that implement all the way through. So I wanted to see what they were doing in the high school. So it was just really neat because, like I said, we are doing all of that on some level, and um, and you know I appreciate that what Dan and the administration is doing because I do go and I realize um, yes there are new things to learn but oh my gosh I think we could lead every one of those like well, you you guys could come out and speak to every one of those and that would be uh, and so it makes me proud to be part of District 203. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. I just think that the team building that we do is important as well. Um, the opportunity that we have um, to sit with each other at some of these and, and you know, Charles said to speak with each other. I think the team building um, opportunity, we don't always get to do that in an open session. And so it's really um, beneficial because we do operate as a team. So I think that the, the time that we get to build um, relationships with the administration, to build relationships with each other is imperative for us to function better as a board. So... I think those are important too. Thank you. Definitely, it was a great con a great um, conference, and I think everyone brought each little part that each will take away. But I agree with Donna; it is very helpful to be able to learn together. You know, we do a lot of learning here as well, but learning together in the areas that we are specifically working on, I think, is a really important thing. And I think that Charles is right. The um, the, the even the keynotes helped with some of those mindset changes. Um, but I specifically went to a number of um, presentations where it was, I, I actually, I love that carousel of panels that Janet and I went to where you actually get a chance, oh, and Donna, that we actually, you get a chance to kind of interact and ask questions during the presentation, specifically back and forth. I love that dialogue, um, particularly when you're looking at ideas that relate to the initiatives that we are looking at, like the achievement gap and um, like building the social capital of our students. So I thought it was a great conference as well. Um, and I, I also really appreciate the fact that our board values learning and continuous learning. I think that we are a model to our students in that regard. So it was great to see every single one of our board members there and learning. So thank you to all of you for that. I got to add just a couple of things real quick, of course. Um, because they were highlight or they were mentioned uh, in some way in the, in the board reports um, uh, regarding District 203 participation yep. in the um, conference itself. I'd like to thank Dr. Knowlton, uh, who, with uh, another panel, presented information on assessment for the state. Uh, and then uh, Carol Hetman uh, was unable to attend and present, uh, but I presented on her behalf uh, what we're doing in terms of uh, building leadership capacity and talent management in District 203. And then I will also add that uh, one of the uh, meetings that I attend uh, every year at this is uh, uh, an annual meeting of the Large Unit District Association. And I'll share with you that uh, John Berkey, Superintendent of Huntley, has accepted the position as the next director of uh, the Large Unit District Association. Diane Rutledge is retiring. So a lot happening. Great. Thanks for that recap. <clears throat> All right. We will move on to item Oh, sorry. Just another one very quick story I wanted to share. Um, as part of the uh, adopt, a, adopt a School program with Ellsworth, I was able to attend their uh, Veterans Day Assembly. And, and uh, just a really quick story that I think should make the, the district and, the, and, and our schools really proud. Um, so as part of that, we had, uh, or they, Ellsworth had 21 um, veterans come in who were either, you know, either um, fathers or grandparents, neighbors, friends. And um, I, I had a conversation with, with a few of them afterward. And uh, so, so these were veterans from the Vietnam War era, 
And they talked about how um, when they came home, they came home with, with zero fanfare. They actually they couldn't wear their uniforms. They didn't, didn't talk about their service. And for, um, for a few of them, it wasn't until they were invited to the Ellsworth Assembly a few years ago um, that they had the chance to be um, honored and to be acknowledged for their service. And, and on one hand, that's, that's really sad, but I, I, it's, it's so nice that, that Ellsworth, and, and I know a lot of our schools were able to do that. So I mean, um, so just, I, I know those assemblies aren't always easy to coordinate and put together, but um, it was just a nice, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice and different way to, to provide an educational um, experience for our students, but it's also, you know, it was, I, I think, a nice way to contribute to the larger community. Definitely. Thank you. And I know the district hosted a wonderful breakfast for the veterans before they went off to the various assemblies as well. So thank you for all that the district has done to honor our veterans. All right. Any other board reports? Okay. Moving on to item 10, discussion without action. Item 10.01, 2017 tax levy determination. Okay. The Board of Education is uh, required by law uh, at least 20 days prior to the adoption of the levy uh, to estimate the aggregate levy for the year. Uh, so this evening, uh, that's the conversation regarding an estimate of the levy. I would also note that at the December 4th Board of Education meeting, we'll have a workshop for further conversation regarding the estimate and the potential levy. On December 18th, we are scheduled to adopt the 2017 tax levy, uh, which must be filed with the county clerk by December 25th, 2017. So CFO Boyan assures us that it will be done before so. With that, I'll turn it over to Marcy for her report. Thank you again. We are presenting the 2017 tentative levy. The purpose of a tax levy is to create a formal request for revenue to be raised from property taxes in order to operate our schools. A levy is a request. What we actually receive is the extension. School districts do not levy based on a rate or a rate increase. A levy is a request for a specific dollar amount. We must file our levy request to the county by the fourth Tuesday in December, December 25th, so we're going to get it in before then. Levy calculations are based upon the consumer price index, new construction, an adjustment to our levy which occurs in the spring, and the equalized assessed valuation of homes in our community. Property value and tax rates determine the amount of revenue a school district can realize. We submit a proposed levy to the county. The actual amount we will receive depends on many variables. And this equation is a simplified example of how the limiting tax rate is determined. Our goal is to plan for future expenses and programs. We typically know what to expect for local tax revenues, but we will levy slightly more than expected to capture any new construction that could be included in the tax base. We can always reduce the levy. We cannot add to it. This is called the truth in taxation law. The equalized assessed value is in our calculations is speculation at this time. We are estimating a 4% increase in the property values, but townships do not have that actual number until the springs in, until the spring. So with the levy due in December, we do estimate. The same goes for new construction. This is an area in which new money is possible, and we're aiming on the hopeful side of $45 million of new construction in our community. One item to note, as equalized assessed values of homes increase, tax rates decrease, and vice versa. The tax cap does not cap your property tax bills or your property assessments. The tax cap does limit property tax revenues that a district receives. Mandated state programs, enrollment fluctuations, and building repairs do not always increase at the same moderation, moderation as the local tax revenues through the tax cap. The levy is created by estimating the equalized assessed value of homes and new construction figures. It is common, as I mentioned, to estimate new construction high in order to capture it for taxation. The county will adjust new construction figures down to the actual numbers in the spring. This is a visual history of the consumer price index fluctuations over the past 10 years. Three-year average, 1.2, five-year, 1.4, and the 10-year average is 1.8. With the equalized assessed value on the rise, we are anticipating a decline in the tax rate. They have an inverse relationship. 
The change in consumer price index year over year is the largest single revenue assumption since it controls an estimate of 85% of our district's revenue. Property Tax Extension Law Limit, or PTEL, uses the prior year CPI for the tax levy. So the 2.1 CPI we're using for the 2017 levy was actually established um, at the end of fiscal year, or I'm sorry, calendar year 2016. Projecting future year CPI percentages can be a guessing game. The Wall Street Journal surveys a group of more than 60 economists on more than 10 major economic indicators on a monthly basis and then summarizes it into a forecast of the next 36 months CPI. The assumption for levy years 2018, 19, and tw I'm sorry, 18, 19, and 2020 CPI are taken from this analysis. For further out years, we simply used the historical 10-year average. The committee had a conversation and was in agreement with the CPI projections. That was the Finance Committee. The district is projecting the property tax values, EAV, will continue to recover in the future. With a 4% estimation in the 2017 levy and estimated a 3% growth annually thereafter. This coupled with the assumptions just discussed, we expect the community's total EAV to grow just under $5.8 billion by 2022. Based upon CPI and new growth assumptions, the district is expecting its aggregate tax levy to increase to $263 million by levy year 2022 if there are no tax raises. With a strong increasing EAV, the district's total tax rate is expected to continue to decline because of the inverse relationship. This is a tax determination with debt service included. On average, without abatement, an existing taxpayer would expect to see about a $230 increase, or 2.1%. Overall tax levy increase of 4.43 includes new, new tax on new growth and construction. We would estimate an overall tax rate of $4.98. This is the tax levy the, the tax determination with, with us abating debt service. Average existing taxpayers would recognize a savings of $88 for the tax year. Overall increase of 3.12%, which includes the new tax on new growth, and a tax rate of $4.91. And I'll remind you, current taxpayers would continue with a 2.1% increase. If all assumptions were to hold true, homeowners would see a reduction in their tax rates as they see an increase in their property values. Abating the debt service levy could save an average homeowner $88 less than if debt service was collected. The estimated increase could be about $142 for an average homeowner or about 2.1% more than last year's school tax. And this is the timeline of our 2017 debt, debt levy. I'm sorry, our 2017 full levy. This evening, we're asking to support a full levy request. We can always choose not to take the full extension. We're also recommending abating debt service in March unless any substantial financial changes occur in the near future. And lastly, to repurchase the 2008 bonds with fund balance totaling $9.5 million. Our efforts are true and with good intentions to be fiscally prudent. And I welcome questions. Thank you, Marcy. Questions from the board? <coughs> Donna? Thank you so much for that report, Marcy. On um, slide 11 where you talk, this is something that I just thought of now, so I didn't uh, give you a chance, so I'm not sure you know the answer. To, um, you probably do, but we'll just go with that. <laughs> um, the consumer price index, where we have the years in um, the previous years in green, and then the current year is yellow, and then the projections are in blue. I'm just interested as into, and you don't have to tell me now, but um, how close are like if we look back at the projections that we had for the previous years that are now in green and yellow? Like I'm just wondering how close, like the projections. I know they're not our projections. You you said that they 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 come out of Wall Street, um, but 
I, I guess I'm curious as to how close they are. I, I can pull up yeah. the presentation from last year. I believe it was included in that okay. uh, to see what they were. Okay. We always know the one coming right. up. We know the yellow and one. And we're actually going to know 2018's Very the third shortly. week in January. Right. Right. And those are the ones that really affect the next two years out. Right. I'm just curious as we're looking, you know, as we're projecting way out, like – if we look, if we take a back look, sure. How close were they? Yeah. Yep. We can have that for the workshop yeah, that's on very the fourth. Easy yep, that's fine. Um, that was something I just thought of. So thank you for that. And then, um, so I understand that the Citizens Finance Advisory uh, uh, supported the taxing, the, the t you know, taking the full tax levy um, to the full extent. Normally, we file that in December, and then when we come back in March and look at the debit service, we don't usually. We I know we can, but we don't usually revisit that so much. Um, Correct. So this year, because we, we've said that we're going to look at, um, you know, where things are at with the property tax freeze, where things are at with anything, any other legislation, I would like to for us to put on our agenda now that we go back and look at, after we file in December, I'm understanding, and I heard you say it now and I heard you say it before, that we can always abate some of that as in addition to the to the debit service if, if needed or if we feel like we need to. That is correct. We do have a very small turnaround time in order to make those changes. So I would recommend that um, we make some decisions ahead of time so that we're able to, we've got about a three to four day turnaround when we get the right. actual extension to submit it back with any changes. From December when we submit no. Oh, we, we actually used. Um, From the time of the scheduled March meeting, right? Until. They will, they will give us the, the, uh, the county final extension will be given to us right around the fourth week of March and think about what happens then with right. spring, break. spring break. And they will ask us within, usually it's like a, it, it could be from a Wednesday to a Wednesday turnaround to return it if we want any changes. Okay. So here's my suggestion. I mentioned January 23rd is the next, next Citizens Finance Advisors Committee. Um, we have that conversation again with them, an updated five-year financial forecast, a better sense of what the spring agenda will look like in Springfield, and then we can look at having that conversation in February. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I would love to have that because I know that once we, in the past at least, once we've filed in December, we don't come back and revisit that. And so I would like to make sure that we come back this year and revisit that in February. That would be outstanding. Um, I know that I understand the conservativeness of wanting to take the full levy. I also feel that, um, you know, in light of the resolution that we just passed, we try to be very trend-setting in the sense that, um, and and looking out for our taxpayers and making sure that we're taking what we need and not a whole lot more. But I understand that we're trying to balance two things, the state uncertainty and being very financially responsible to our taxpayers. And so um, the fact that we can take the full levy and abate some of it without losing that full levy um, is an exciting concept to me that I really want to make sure that we look at in February so, uh, and discuss as a board. So thank you for that. And I think, let me look, I think that was my only question. Uh, that's it. Thank you. I think if we were ever going to look at um, why we drafted the resolution, the previous presentation where you gave the different scenarios based on the property tax freeze is the rationale for it. Just looking at the difficulty for us in trying to um, be fiscally responsible and um, have for example, when we do such great work as to underspend and, and have our audit come back with additional funds because we've worked so hard to be efficient, you know, when we work hard to have the, those savings be passed on to taxpayers, it's difficult to do so with the lack of certainty from our state. And I, um, I think that that's the goal of our resolution is to try to help us um, navigate that uncertainty and still be able to take actions without having to worry about being... Um, you know, actions that we can't anticipate. Um, however, I do think in the interim time period before that resolution becomes law, and let's say we hope it really does quickly, um, but before that becomes law, the idea of taking the full levy and then abating some of that levy is the way to go because that way we're not um, constrained by that changing that overall levy level, but we can still, if we have the possibility, um, return some of those savings to the taxpayers. So. Thank you for your work, too. Sure. 
investigate that because I know that is something that we haven't done in the past. And I think that that's something that we want to try to look at as we continue to go forward, providing we don't have state action that changes our financial situation um, to our detriment. And if the board were to recommend the abatement of the 2017 debt service levy and the redemption of the 2008 bonds, those are, that, that's. Yeah, I wanted to hit a couple of key points in summary here, unless there's additional board questions. Just I think important key points, not only for uh, the board and where we're at right now, but to make sure our community understands when you go back to that key point slide, homeowners should expect, as it is in our recommendation already, the, two, the District 203 tax rates to decline in, in, in the next levy. Um, Assuming we abate the debt service levy, which we have been talking about, uh, we're estimating an $88 savings to the average homeowner. Okay? In addition, uh, it, our plan at this point is to repurchase the remainder of the 2008 bonds early, resulting in over a $3 million savings, long-term savings to our taxpayers. So even without um, any, abating any of the levy, um, we are seeing and projecting a savings to the taxpayers in Naperville 203, and I think that represents strong financial practices by this Board of Education. So we will certainly take a critical look at where we're at uh, in the spring or early spring, late winter, February, um, and see if there are other additional opportunities for us. But uh, we want to remain cautious uh, with the state of Springfield and how certainly. decisions in Springfield regarding uh, local dollars um, uh, may impact our community. So thank you, Marcy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so just a note for the board, as was already mentioned, if you have additional questions, um, we will be able to consider those questions in the first meeting of December. So if you have some, go ahead and send them along so that we can be preparing. Um, even information that would help you in terms of looking at um, some of the factors in the financial forecast, anything like that, ask, uh, pass those questions on and we can consider any additional information on December 4th, and then action will be taken in the second meeting of December. Okay, moving on to item 11, discussion with action. 11.01, .01, Summer School 2018. At our last Board of Education meeting, our Director of Summer Learning, Kevin Okevich, in support with Chief Operating Officer Bob Ross, presented our recommendations for the 2018 Summer Learning Program. Mr. Ross, are there any additional information that needs to be presented to the Board this evening? Yes, thank you, Mr. Bridges. Mr. Okevich had planned to be here tonight, but was unable to be here. Um, there is one additional document that's been added to board docs. If you look at this agenda item, um, we reloaded the two documents that were there last meeting, but there's also an additional one, a one page slide entitled summer school program, multi-year recap. That was in an effort uh, to address a question that had arisen about, um, expenditures over the years, over the last few years. This is an attempt to address that concern. I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Okay, questions from the board? Donna? So I really appreciate the year side by side, the yearly com comparison. Um, I think if our community looks at that, they um, uh, will see a large increase in numbers each year. And so I think that explaining that a little bit and understanding um, why we've had the increases that we have and and I know some of the answers to these but I just think that they need to be addressed because I, I don't want the community to uh, not realize the value of our summer school program sure I'd appreciate the chance to do that yes um, the bottom line number in the balance line item for each year is of course the um, what I'm gonna call the investment that the board has elected to make and that we're asking you to make for 2018 uh, to support summer learning um, you'll see as we move from left to right in that document that investment increasing significantly um, and some questions came up about what were some of the what were some of the reasons for that and underneath each year uh, we've attempted to kind of uh, provide some information but I'd like to to highlight a couple of things it's a significant increase between 2016 and the summer of 2017 not just at the bottom line but if you were to look up above at payroll and benefits to some extent, but at the payroll line. There was an increase there. In, uh, what we did is we had a change in the teacher's contract, which was actually approved in June of 2016, and we bargained it so late that we agreed that we wouldn't have uh, summer school pay rates. Summer school was fixing to, be, to begin very shortly. Those rates wouldn't kick in until the following summer 17. So the reason you see a significant increase in payroll between 16 and 17 is 2000, summer 17 was the first year that those new pay rates kicked in. Um, 
th- those pay rates will remain in 2018, and so you see those there as well. You'll see um, another expected uh, increase in the payroll line between 17 and 18. The pay rate's the same, as I just mentioned, but we will have two more days of summer school in 2018 than we did in 2017. In past, we used to have 15 days first semester, I'll call it, and 15 days second semester. And then depending where the holiday fell, sometimes it was 15 days and 14 days. Last year it was 15 days and 13 days. We had an opportunity this year in 2018 to return to 15 days and 15 days. I think that's good. I think it's good for kids. But it's that many more hours of hourly rate um, that adds up to what you're seeing there. In addition, we're proposing for 2018 that we add teaching positions in an attempt to to focus on all the efforts we've talked about in all our discussions about summer school, that too brings an increase in cost. So those are the reasons for the increased numbers that you'll see in the payroll line and in the, the bottom line, the balance line. Donna? So I thought it was interesting. I went back to our um, October 2nd report that um, Mr. Wilkevich gave. And also part, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think part of that increase is also from our um, wavered student fees have increased dramatically. So, which is the uh, st- you know students that we'd like to see being able to use our summer schools so that there's not a um, uh, that summer loss. And so, if I'm correct, I think we um, increased by like a hundred and eighty six thousand dollars in waivers as well um, from. Oh no no I'm sorry. We increased by 111,000 in waivers um, from 2016 to 2017, and 111 in waivers from the year bef- before as well. So, um, I, I just think that that's 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 got to be dealing with our our final cost as well. Correct? Oh, absolutely. Okay. That, that goes into the hopper as well and affects right. that bottom line investment number. Right. Yes. So, I guess my only, I, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm excited. You can tell that I'm excited about the investment that we're making, but then at the same time, I'm hoping and I'm, I'm sharing with the administration that I don't think we can continue to grow at this rate because it becomes it's you know it's four times the cost that it was two years ago. So, I think that, that it's a good investment, but I think we just need to be aware that we can't continue on that trend. So, um, that just throwing that out there. <laughs> I think that we want to keep in mind the fact that um, summer school, you know, just as we've talked a little bit um, in terms of the the efforts that we've been looking at with the achievement gap, I think summer school and our continued investment and the increase in students in summer school and thus staff to be able to serve those students effectively, that's a direction we want to go. You know, I, I guess from my perspective, I'm pleased to see the increase in fee, in, in um in students that we've had. Um, I think what we had in the past, we had seen our costs more equivalent to our um, to our revenues. Um, so if you looked at this and you said, okay, we, we know that we have a significant portion of students who won't, aren't going to be bringing in revenue, but we want them there. Um, the only um, thing that you could do to equalize that out would be to um, try to have your other students um, make up more of the cost. But from my perspective, any student that goes to summer school, it's positive for us. Whether that student is going for enrichment or whether they're going for, um, you know, to catch up or whether they're going to continue their summer learning, I think that we definitely want our students there. So there's that question in my mind about you wouldn't want to increase the fees too much because that would discourage participation from our other students. And I think it's outstanding to see our summer student um, groups, all of our students growing so much. And we want to continue to see growth for our students that, that do have fee waivers, that don't have fee waivers. I think we've put in a number of um, important areas that have increased our expenditure to reduce barriers like transportation. Um, And from my perspective, I think that's very positive. Um, I think the other thing that we want to look at in terms of the investment, and it is an investment, is that we are investing in something that will help our students, but we're not required to do so. And thus that investment also, um, it's not something that will count against us when we look at our overall cost per pupil. Because since it's not a, correct me if I'm wrong, 
since it's not a mandated expenditure, anything we do there just adds to what we have for students, and it doesn't, you know, um, it, it, it won't have an impact for us in looking at um, whether or not we're going farther above our um, target in terms of our, our, fin our spending for our um, overall cost per pupil. I, please don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm excited that we have more students on waivers that are joining, and, and the other students as well. I, what I'm saying is, is that we need to just be aware of our expenses then, and, um, and, and not allow, I, and just be very um, financially, you know, have good stewardship in the sense of, um, yes, we've added staff, yes, we've added transportation. Um, maybe we, we like let it level here a little bit and see how things are going, hoping that more students, you know, do still participate, but I'm talking about the expenditures, not so much the revenue. I'm, I'm not, I, I understand that's why I add it to, to your explanation that yes, we're losing revenue as well. I get that with the, with the uh, wave student fees. But at the same time, I want us just to be aware of our expenditures that we do have some control over so that we are not continuing to grow by four times every two years. Not that the program I don't want to grow, but I want us to look at the expenditures and try to, do you, do you see what I'm trying to say? I'm not, I, I'm supporting that we, it is an investment. I agree so, with you completely. I think I'll, what I'd like to do is remind the board that we did indicate that we'd be evaluating and reviewing our summer school program as well. And I think as a result of that analysis and review, we'll have to then come back and have a conversation about really the direction that we'd like to go right. with it. Right. And then I think also, you know, if, it's, if it is about, we look at it as a part of our overall budgeting in, in expenditures, and that if the board wishes to continue to invest in summer school, for, for example, we'll have to look at expenditures in other areas to be able to offset that perhaps. So. Right. Certainly, and I, I do think that we do have a significant amount of students who would still benefit from summer school that aren't in summer school yet. So um, in terms of our efforts to continue to attract students to summer school, that's something that I, I do, I, I'm excited to hear um, the results of the Hanover research that you all are doing in the review there. I think that, you know, the more that we can definitely be efficient in our services, but continue to attract the students who would benefit. I think that will overall, it will help our overall efforts to prevent summer slide and continue to close the achievement gap. Yeah. Paul? I very much agree with what Donna is saying. And I'd rather not penalize the students and parents of those who choose not to participate in summer school. And if we need to bump the revenue side of it, that's something we need to look at. Or if we need to control the expenditure side of it, I'm willing to approach it in either direction. But the people who don't participate are going to end up funding that. And I'd rather not penalize them just because they choose not to. Charles? Uh, a couple things. One, um, you, you, Donna, you mentioned some numbers um, about the waivers was that somewhere in there or was that a separate question that i october made? 2nd we had ah, a report okay and then there was a annual on the on page 15 of that there's an annual cost of wave student fees which will detail that for you okay very good thank you um the other the other question i have is that um it seems like you know as we go year to year the expenses will, will go up but it's not necessarily um a direct correlation one more student doesn't necessarily equal that amount of potentially waived revenue in e equal cost, right? So there's a there's a capacity of students that can be, so the program can grow to a certain extent without necessarily having the expenditures grow at the same rate. Is that am I thinking about that correctly or no? Y yes, Mr. Kush, but also the opposite. If you, mm -hmm. if you had if you had ten more students join or X number more students join, and they were all paying fees, that'd be one thing. If you had the same X number of students joining, none of them were paying fees, it'd be the other way. So yes, it's not a one-to-one. -one. It depends how many more students come. It also depends whether or not they're paying. Right. And you the said more I'm students we invite to participate in summer school and the program grows, is going to require more courses to be offered, more sections to be taught, right. more teachers to be added right. to be able to meet that increased I would, need. I would just be curious to try to understand what where some of those steps are. So I guess to Donna's point around going forward, you know, making sure that the expenditures aren't growing too rapidly. If we see uh, the increased benefit of, of, of students coming in and we see that having an impact on uh, overall student learning, I know that, tr that there's tremendous learning loss over the summer, especially for some grades. So this can obviously help to mitigate a lot of that. So I'd be, I'd be interested in just trying to understand. I know that 
Dan, you mentioned that there'll be a full analysis, but I think as part of that, we need to really think about the the value that um, um, that the students get across uh, across the board around this, and even the students that don't necessarily participate. Um, the 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 for the instructors in the classroom, um, if they if there are other students that are in there and had learning loss over the summer, I think think we need to evaluate what the value is of not having that learning loss over the summer in terms of instructional time, in terms of um, time that the staff has to spend um, helping to catch students up candidly. So it's it's a broader way to look at it. It's Agreed, fun. especially as we have such a large effort on the achievement gap. Any efforts that we make to um, lessen that d does impact all students the following year. So I, I agree a lot with, I agree with what you said. And I think that the more that our analysis can show um, those actual, you know, the real value that we're providing, um, that's going to be helpful to us. We may also want to look at, um, you know, where are our fees? How do they compare to others? And I know that it's been some time since we did look at that. Um, but, you know, that can, that can help us determine, hmm, well, yeah, they're about at the right level or, oh, well, maybe they aren't. You know, so that's something that might be something that we could look at as well. So I, I guess maybe, you know what, I didn't explain as well because my numbers, I'm such a number person that <laughs> as I saw that there, let me just give you a little bit more. So as I saw that there was a $186,000 uh, increase between 2016 and 2017, I wanted to understand why. And so when I went back and looked at the October 2nd um, report that we had, I noticed that 111000 of it was from 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 waived student fees. So really there's a difference there of 75,000, not 186,000. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that, that that's, that's the increase that we should, there's really more of an increase than the 186,000 that we're seeing. So I, I guess I didn't communicate that as well as I, as I understood it in all my numbers without you know, having a board up here to draw it for you. Um, but I, I still think that we just need to look at that and wonder, okay, so yes, I know it's not a one-to-one. -one, I understand that completely, but we still have an increase, and, and yes, it's a very good investment. I just want us to be conscientious about looking at that increase and seeing um, where it's all going and, what, and, what's, and what's happening there so that we understand projecting out farther. That's all. Yes, we're certainly keeping an eye on expenditures, and we'll make certain that we do moving forward. Sure. Christine. I'm trying to formulate the question as everyone's talking, so if it doesn't come out right. Um, so, Dan, is, is, is there, if, if I'm looking at just what's in front of me these five years, including next summer, is that long enough to evaluate if we're seeing positive changes in the school year? Like, so I'm, I, I, I'm with Donna on watching you know, there's there's definitely a cost factor, but how much time, and, and this could be answered another time, how much time do we need, how much data do we need to say that putting the money in summer school is saving us the staff and efforts so and resources? Staff an opportunity to discuss that and look at in, in parallel with the analysis that yeah. we may do regarding the overall program, then I'm sure Dr. Knowlton will have an opinion about what data can tell us over a period of time, as well as Hanover and their review of our work. So we'll that certainly would, make that a part of our report back. That would be very helpful for for me in when we do have that conversation. So thank you. I have one more question for the next time that we get to this. Um, there's data on summer learning loss that I'm asking Patrick because I, I think you'll come back with some of this. But we were told on October 2nd that there's data on summer learning loss and that um, there were students that were measured that if they attended 80% of the time, um, they didn't, when we're looking at performance series testing, which is I think what you're asking too, like how much, you know, can we measure that there was no loss? And it, it said that there was the students who attended 80% of the time or, you know, didn't have summer learning loss. So I guess I'm wondering if like, you know, how many students were we measuring there and was it 100% of them that we didn't see learning loss in? And I don't expect those answers now, but as we go back and look at the summer school report, I'd like to understand, are we talking about 10 students? Are we talking about the whole... Uh, 330 elementary students, you know, I, that's what I kind of want to understand because that'll get, be a better measurement. Thank you. Paul. If there's so much benefit to extending the school year, and I think there is, let's do it for all students and share the cost amongst all students as opposed to shifting the, the burden onto the ones that do not attend 
we all agree that more school time is better, and let's make that available to everyone or require it. That also, spread the cost yeah, accordingly. I'd also remind the board that we do have two committees working is in relation to our uh, strategic, blue, strategic blueprint regarding the instructional day right now as well. Uh, and so we're looking at the elementary day and the junior high school day, so that will have an, a, a bearing on it. I'd also like to remind the board that we have approved a calendar uh, for the 18-19 school year uh, and that uh, any other, in terms of length of any calendar, would uh, certainly have collective bargaining implications that we could look at. Now, in January, Mr. Ross will come to the Board of Education with uh, the calendar criteria th that we look at, and certainly the, that could be part of that conversation at that time. Okay. So, in summary, we're going to hear a little bit more in... Um, our next conversation about um, efficiencies as well as value. Um, anything else that I'm missing? What was your question? Just to make sure that is this enough time? Okay. To make sure so that data, we're seeing it in the school year. We'll have the data. We'll have more inf more information about efficiencies as well as value. Anything else that we wanted to see investigated? I know there's the overall research that's being done by Hanover and by our staff as well. Okay, great. So we need a motion then to approve our current summer school recommendations. Uh, I move to approve item 11.01, .01, summer school 2018. Second. A motion is second, I heard. Will you please call the roll, Ms. Bell? Aye. 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 Yes. Push. Aye. Okay, the motion passes. Moving on to item 11.02, Driver's Ed Simulator Waiver. Earlier this evening, administration presented a recommendation to the Board of Education to approve a, a, a waiver for the school code to allow the use of uh, computer sim simulators to fulfill three of six hours on the street driver education requirement. There were no comments made by the community. Um, we'll be happy to answer any additional questions that the board may have. Questions from the board? Okay, if there's no questions, I will entertain a motion to pass the driver's ed simulator waiver. I move to approve item 11.02, the driver's ed simulation waiver as presented. A motion and a second are heard. Please call the roll, Ms. Bell. Aye. 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 Yes. The motion passes. Moving on to item 11.03, designating interest earnings resolution. The November 6, 2017 Board of Education meeting, the administration presented a recommendation to the Board of Education to adopt a resolution declaring all interest earned in current fiscal year, retain designation as interest and further, preserve the board's option to transfer in interest to other fund types. Uh, CFO Boyan, any additional information to present? Nothing at this time. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for the board on item 11.03? Okay, I'll take a motion. I move to approve item 11.03, designating interest earning resolution as presented. A motion is second or heard. Please call the roll, Ms. Bell. Young? Aye. Bunty? Yes. Push. Aye. 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 The motion passes. Moving on to item 11.04, policy review, second reading, policies 2.220, school board meeting procedure, and 2.104, internal organization. At the November 6th Board of Education meeting, administration presented a recommendation to the board regarding policy 2.104 and 2.220. Mr. Ross, any additional information? No, there have been no questions and no additional information since the last meeting. We have to answer your questions. So I guess at this point, I'd like to get the board's perspective. This is a policy that Terry brought forward, but he's not able to be with us here tonight. Um, we can certainly go forward as it is on the agenda. We can go forward and um, vote on it, or we could also table it and wait until the, next, the first meeting in December and when uh, he has returned. So perspectives from the board on whether or not to just wait on this, since it was Terry's initiative to look at this um, policy or if you want to go ahead and move forward I think if there's not a lot of discussion or question we can move forward I think if there's a lot of discussion and question 
then I would propose that we table it so that Terry can have some input on that. Okay. I agree with that. Okay. So let's ask, is there discussion and debate with regard to item 11.04? There was limited discussion on the November 6th meeting, and we've had no new questions that have come forward, so. Questions or thoughts from the board or discussion? I got a motion. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll go ahead with the motion then. All right. I move, I move approval of uh, item 11.04, both items, as presented. A motion and a second are heard. Please call the roll, Miss Bell. Young. Aye. Carol. Aye. Yes. Aye. Yeah. Aye. The motion passes. Okay, moving on to item 12, old business. Item 13, new business. Item 14, upcoming events. Certainly, I'd like to call it to attention uh, to the Board of Education as well as our community in events scheduled. Uh, our first Focus 203 series of the, the school year. Uh, we'd like to invite uh, our community to join uh, District 203 and Loyola University of Chicago professor, author, and suicide intervention expert, Dr. Jonathan Singer, for a community conversation about suicide. Uh, Dr. Singer will imp present important information on suicide, including myths and facts, risk factors, warning signs, protective factors, and interventions. I'll also provide attendees with tools and information on resources to support mental health and well-being. Uh, and we will do this in the format of our traditional Focus 203 series. So the community is invited to join us at either 7 p.m. in the Naperville Central High School cafeteria on November 30th or 9.30 a.m. at the Pavilion at Mesa and Sabica on December 1st. For those who are familiar with the, two, the Focus 203 series, note that these, these are changes in dates from our typical format. This is Thursday night, 7 p.m. at our normal location for the evening presentation, Neighborville Central. But note the change in uh, time and location for the Friday morning session. We've bumped it back from our typical 8.30 start to 9.30, and it's located at the Pavilion at Mesa and Sabica. Information regarding this event can be found on the District 203 webpage. Okay, any other events that people would like to highlight from our upcoming events? Okay. If not, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. A motion and a second are heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>